Hello and welcome to episode 379 of the Mark and Me podcast. As always, I'm your host Mark. Now joining me on today's episode is Landon Tours, the singer of the awesome band The Plot In You. This band are a band that I've only recently discovered. I know they've been going for about 15 years, but I've only recently got into them. But I've absolutely fell in love with everything I've heard. And the good news is, if you're listening to this right now, they're right now on a UK tour. Then they're going across Europe, so go and see them. If you can't get out and go and see them live, then check out any of their work. They're absolutely awesome. I've been listening to Volume 1 and Volume 2, the EPs, which are just blowing my mind, and I can't wait for Volume 3. They're just a band that have just hit everything I look for in music. I love the dynamics. I love the way they've evolved from each release, and Landon is a great interview. And I think the best thing to do right now is to get straight to it. So here's me and Landon talking all things music. So Landon, thank you for joining me today on the Mark and Me podcast. No problem. Thanks for having me. What I'd like to do, Landon, with all guests that come on is take it right back to the very start. So I'm always intrigued when you were growing up, maybe as a kid, if you were given an album or with your own pocket money, you bought an album that made you fall in love with music. Yeah, I think one of my first albums uh, that I ever bought was uh, Maylene and the Sons of Disaster. I don't know if you remember that band. Um, I remember the name, uh, but I never listened to them. Yeah, it was the old singer of Under Oath. Um, yeah. He has started a new band. It was like um, like Southern metal, like super heavy. Um, and I thought it was cool. I liked the singing parts. Um, I think that was the first CD I bought. But I, I before that, I had gotten into like Yellow Card and stuff. But I was I only I was only able, I, I didn't have any money, so I always just downloaded stuff on LimeWire and Kazaa. I don't know if you remember those, mate. I um, used to remember like going to bed and then leaving LimeWire on overnight because it wasn't fast. Yeah. You, know, you didn't have fast broadband, <laughs> and you'd wake up and be like, "I hope that file is what it says it is," and it'd be a song. It wouldn't even be an album, like yeah, .mp3, and you'd double click, and yeah. it was like, "Ah, oh, fuck! It's not the song I wanted." Yeah, or sometimes it could be something completely different. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> that happened Especially a couple pictures, times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how I I got most of my uh, my first songs. I um, there was a network called Fuse TV. I don't know if you remember that. Um, I it don't was a, know. an American. It was an American station, and I think they were the only station that played videos like from like screamo and emo bands and stuff like that. Um, I don't know how we randomly just got this station. Um, and that's where I found like My Chemical Romance, Jimmy Eat World, Under Oath, like a bunch of those like early emo bands. Um, and yeah, that kind of put me onto a bunch of different stuff. But yeah, the first album I ever bought though was that Maylene CD. But then yeah, past that, I was just like, anytime I could scrape up money, I was going to the record store and trying to pick up new stuff. So You've yeah, mentioned cool. some, was... uh, some incredible bands there, especially the foundations of stuff like My Chemical Romance and Under Oath, like bands I still yeah. listen to every day today. And um, yeah. I was wondering where it changed for you, because live music is where I kind of really fell in love and wanted to be in a band myself. And kind of, mm-hmm. I remember, I think I was around 12 or 13, and I went to see Green Day on their Dookie tour. It was one of the first gigs I ever went to, but I just couldn't believe that three musicians in front of me on stage was making such a huge sound. And I was like, that's Mm -hmm. all I want to do for the rest of my life is be like Billy Joe Armstrong. And I wondered, was yours such a great first gig or is it an embarrassing one that you don't tell people? Or can you remember Uh, that first show? Kind of embarrassing. I I went to this, uh, there was this band called Newsboys. They were like a Christian rock band. I don't even nice. know if they're still a thing anymore, but <laughs> I went to some like uh, church convention that my parents made me go to and I saw them and I was like, honestly, not affected by it at all. I, I don't <laughs> think I, I don't think I cared at all. Um, I, I think that some of the first uh, shows that like were impactful to me were like local band shows in my yeah. area. There was like one, it wasn't even a venue. It was just like a, like a, a center where you'd have like a college graduation or like a wedding reception. There was a guy in my, my town that would put on shows once a month 
and me and my friends would always go and just watch like all the local bands from our area and there were like there were some surrounding cities that bands would come from but there was like a couple that i saw i was like i need to do that that's so cool and uh so yeah through that through that uh that community i I met like a lot of local musicians around me and that's kind of how i started like getting into bands myself um but yeah, uh, that, I mean, that now, leads lovely to my kind of. I am always intrigued. Did you do the whole kind of school and college bands thing and the battle of the bands and trying to make a name for yourself in covers bands or anything like that? I don't know how it all started. Yeah, we we did do a couple battle of the bands. Uh, I don't think we won or even placed in anything. We we're always really really bad, and also like we were the only band I think in my entire city that like screamed. I think so. We like probably freaked everyone scared out, everyone but, off. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, but yeah, it was just, yeah, we barely knew how to play any instruments. We were all just kind of like throwing shit together and trying to make <laughs> anything sound cool. Um, I remember we did our first few demos on just like a, a laptop mic. Remember those like flimsy yeah, little ones that plug straight, like the squarey kind of. Yeah, we would just put it in the things. center of our practice wow. space and just record like that. Um, and it, it was hilarious. I think I still have one of the demos somewhere, but. Yeah, Weirdly, they we didn't start. sound too bad. Those mics, I remember doing old practices with my old band and just sticking it in the middle of the room. And actually, looking back, it, it was all right. It didn't do too yeah. bad. For the time being, yeah. yeah. It, wasn't, it wasn't the worst. Yeah, but I mean, it's crazy now. Like, a kid in his basement can make yeah. like a, a, a song that could compete like on the radio it's cra- with all the things that we have now. What I would have given to have that kind of, the oh. kind of technology we have now back then, like, it blows Probably my mind all the plugins yeah. and the apps that you can get now that literally Dude, these kids these kids don't know how lucky they are it's i know crazy. i remember having <laughs> a, a, like a tascam uh four track and it'd be yeah, on yeah. cassette so you'd be pushing mm-hmm. you know record and play at the same time while tracking a guitar and then to play over the top would be a second trap on top of that cassette and it was so fiddly and so annoying and if you made that mistake halfway through a take You'd have to hot, mm. like start the whole thing from scratch. I'm like, yeah. there was there was no <laughs> digital plugins or uh, AI yeah. to take faults out or anything. So uh, I sound like a granddad, yeah. but my god, you no. have to work hard. Yeah, dude, it's crazy now. Yeah, like I said, you can just be a full band yourself in a computer. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, these, these I kids saw are lucky. A, uh, I saw an AI app the other day, which terrifies me for the music industry. But it was like you just type a prompt in, so you'd be like a band that sound like My Chemical Romance with Deftones, with vocals a bit like uh, Chino, and write yeah. the song about uh, I don't know a notebook, and within seconds yeah. it would generate it and then play it back, and it sounded unbelievable, like the production, the yeah. drums, the guitars, and I was like, oh fuck, like the industry is screwed. Dude, yeah, somebody, actually somebody I was working with like a month or two ago had something similar to that. They just like, they were, they asked me like, tell me a couple things to put in. And with, yeah, like you said, a couple seconds, a song popped up. I was just like, dude, this is really scary. But at the same time, it was like, it still has its flaws. You know what I mean? Like, it's not perfect yeah. yet, but I, and I it, can only And it imagine, can't like, tour. It can't make t-shirts and go on tour and sign autographs yeah. or play shows. But I was a bit like, oh God, I expect this to sound terrible. And it did actually sound pretty good. Yeah. Hey, I remember the drum mix in it. I was like, yeah. that sounds way too good. That's that's a little <laughs> scary. But <laughs> but I will say I still think there's like there's like a human element that I feel like at least not yet it can't be duplicated like the emotion and like a human voice, you know what I mean? Yeah, of course. I, I feel like that's something that really can't be replicated, at least not yet. But um and, and yeah, I love I, mean, I love they're... bands that do live tracking. So a big band that I absolutely yeah. adore is Frice, and because mm-hmm. they record in their own home studio and stuff, sometimes it's more of a performance that's captured on record. And I can hear the guitar is not even like slightly muffled, but it's not crystal polished clear. And I love that. Yeah. I love the authenticity sure. of a guitar or a, a snare drum not being quite right. It just makes it real, and I don't want it to sound too yeah. polished. So uh, I'm all for still keeping it as it is i think the thing that freaks me out more than even that is like um like ai mixing and stuff and stuff like that because i feel like that's where it could actually start taking away jobs in the industry because if you can just like plug in exactly like prompt exactly how you want to mix to sound and you can just scroll through a bunch of options of different mixes and just tweak like little things like without actually knowing anything about mixing that's where it kind of freaks me out a little bit but 
hopefully we're still a little ways off from that. Especially even. the time as well. Like, I don't want to make this all about AI, but if you yeah. tell it to, you know, mix a song and they do, and it does it in 10 minutes instead of a couple of weeks, my yeah. God, like think of the money saved and the it's scary. Yeah, it is. But I'm just praying that we have at least a couple more years. So <laughs> <laughs> make as much can... as you can right now. Yeah, me and my friends can make some money first before our, our jobs go away. <laughs> so, obviously, your history, you were talking then about being at college and Battle of the Bands and kind of finding yourself within the music scene and making a name for yourself. And mm. you were in a band uh, before their eyes. And I believe mm. that, obviously, um, the plot in you came as a kind of a side project to that. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And did it kind of become that, the plot in you kind of grew bigger and was like a snowball where it kind of just grew at a pace then that the side project became kind of a the old thing that you had to leave behind or uh kind of so um you remember i said that uh those uh those shows in my local scene that yeah. i was talking about that we so the the singer of my old band nick uh right. he was the guy that actually put on those shows like literally the only shows in our whole city um, so I met him through that and that's how I got into before their eyes. And then, um, so I was, I was in that band for two, maybe two and a half years, something like that. And, uh, things just kind of started falling apart towards the end. The singer kind of wanted to focus more on his family and like, um, just like his job at home. And he had a late, he had started a label and things like that. Um, so we were like trying to find a new singer and stuff like that. And all around that time, I also had plot as like a side project. And I started getting more into producing. So I was like, I'm just going to have plot as kind of like my thing for fun on the side. And then, you know, focus on producing. But then once I like fully left before their eyes to like just focus on that stuff, um, we got a, an offer from a label to sign. So I was like, well, I'm still super young and I got plenty of time. I don't work a real job or anything. So I was like, I'll just, you know, I'll try to balance both. And that's kind of like where plot ended up like, taking off and well i mean not taking off it was like seven eight years of doing bullshit like horrible tours and yeah <laughs> things like that but uh yeah i mean it was a very slow gradual um climb up but but yeah it was it was cool and i'm i'm still really close with all the guys and in, in before their eyes and stuff like that and i think everyone ended up finding their place and like you know finding what they're excited to do and in, in life and things like that and uh but yeah it was it was very organic, like the shift from one thing to another. There was no like hard feelings or drama or anything like that. It was all just very organic. Things just kind of fell into place. So it was cool. With the plot in you, did you, when it was kind of growing, were you able to take a step back and see the kind of um, the way that you evolved and that you were growing at quite a big pace? I know you said you worked for years to get it, but were you seeing that the shows were getting busier? Were you seeing that more merch was being sold? Were you seeing that there's more people to meet afterwards and the kind of lineup poster would see your name going higher at each different festival? Or were you just too caught up in it to kind of take a step back and breathe? Ah, that's a good question. Like I said, dude, we were kind of just like, like this for a yeah. long time. You know what I mean? Like really didn't see a whole lot of growth uh, for the first like, uh, like, two to five years like it was all just kind of like we were the opening band or like two of five on almost every tour and that definitely like started getting a little bit like i don't know it got old you know what i mean i was starting to lose steam and things like that so i think it was like around the five or six year mark we were like I, at least i was starting to feel ready to slow down and that was kind of like where we randomly just kind of had a, kind of a moment where things popped off and then it was kind of like another thing where it was just like, and then another couple of years went by and we still kept writing on that. Like we'd kind of went from here to here and just went like that. And then it was uh, the album Disposed. That's kind of when we signed to Fearless. That's when things like completely turned around because had that record not happened, had we not signed to Fearless, I don't think I would still be doing plot. I think I would have just like transitioned solely just in producing and songwriting and stuff like that, which I think I would have been also happy doing, but it's, it's kind of crazy how things worked out. It's like almost it's like almost every time I'm like right at the cusp of just like I'm ready to move on, like I'm done with the band stuff. It's something stupid happens and we end up going at it for a couple more years. So yeah. What, what yeah do you I mean think it's cool. It I'm not do you complaining. think it was the timing of a new label or 
was there something just about that moment in time do you think that actually switched because you were so not comfortable but you if you were going for you know the, the same kind of uh lifespan of the band you know you were kind of doing the same shows and not seeing a huge growth like you said uh, something must something must have changed like was it the album you wrote that you then think people just suddenly got or do you think it was because you changed labels and there was a different marketing or a different push or new blood in the I band think, you know i think it was like the perfect culmination of like all of those things yeah. you know what i mean um because like um even i mean that record was the first record i had written about like um like a breakup type thing and i'd yeah. never done ventured into anything like that before it, everything was more like um about like way heavier like darker topics you know in my life so that was kind of maybe the more like most intimate i'd ever been like with our audience or whatever um yeah i like really just didn't hold back i was just just allowed myself to be very vulnerable on that album and i think it was that and also having a label that really believed in us and was like excited and passionate about what we were doing um, you know, and I feel like everyone just kind of had the mindset of like, if this is going to be the last record, let's go out with a bang, you know, like let's, we had a, a drummer too, that was doing all our videos and he was just incredible at what he did. So it was literally like just a perfect storm. You know what I mean? Just all the, all the right things came together at the right time with the right people. And, um, yeah, it just, it worked out. And I, I think that kind of saved the band, which is cool. And Does it kind of make to you um, believe in fate a little bit that it, all, it was all at a certain time? It seems a bit too much of a coincidence that everything happened like that in such a short space of time, but there were huge things to happen. Yeah, possibly. I mean, it's it's hard to say. Yeah, I mean, it's looking back on just like how uh, how perfectly everything came together. You know what I mean? Like right at the right moment because I. Yeah, like I said, we're. I feel like that was like kind of a moment where we were all on the same page as far as like, this is probably going to be the last thing. You know what I mean? And uh, so yeah, I mean, had it gone any other way, I don't think I'd be talking to you right now. So yeah, I guess in a sense, for sure, I do think there there could be an element of fate of fate there. Yeah, but yeah, it's just crazy to think that was like five six years ago that we were at that place, and now like still doing this stuff you know i didn't think i'd be still doing it into my mid 30s so it's pretty pretty wild it's good though isn't it because it could have gone the opposite way like you said if you you were probably on your last breath for that band and kind of thought fuck this like i can't yeah. keep doing this anymore so it's it's such a nice thing that we're sitting here and it has been a a really kind of successful and positive uh move instead of us talking about how it could have been you know yeah yeah, I, I also I do also believe though that like had it gone another way, I think it would have been fine as well. Because yeah. you know I'm I'm very I'm very passionate about producing songwriting and stuff like that, and that's I think that's what I want to end up doing, no matter what, like long like in the long run. Yeah. Um. Once I'm done with all the touring and stuff, I really just enjoy songwriting and being behind the computer and helping other people create music and stuff. I think I honestly sometimes I feel like I enjoy that even more. Um, but I think like, you know, there's always time for that down the road. I'm only going to be this age once. So I'm trying to, you know, do all the touring and all this experience, all this while it's available to me. So, yeah. Is it, is it tough when you know how to use all the tools and you're in the studio and you're demoing and you're in control sometimes of your own music sometimes? I mean, my bands weren't successful, but I would never want to be hands on myself because it was too personal. So I like the idea of there being a, a, a different dynamic or a different kind of set of thoughts when editing or trying ideas for the band. Is it difficult for you sometimes to switch that off and be like, I don't want to be the producer. I don't want to be an, uh, an, <laughs> an engineer here. I want to just be the songwriter. No, honestly, uh, I I think I love that. I think that's my favorite part of being in yeah. in the band and, and all this stuff. Um, yeah, I, I I mean, I've just I've always done it from the yeah. the beginning of the band, so it's like all I've ever really known. Um, we did one album with another producer, and overall, it was like a really really positive, good experience. I learned a lot, but I don't think we would ever do it again, just because I'm so. Uh, I, I guess I'm too much of a 
perfectionist in some ways, but I also just like to really take my time with things. And I feel like I'm abusing another person. <laughs> if no, they that's have to, fair. Like, sit, yeah. Sit through my process. Cause you know, I like to try like a million different ideas and pick things apart and to like put someone else through that. <laughs> it's just like, it feels unfair. So I don't know. I, I much rather, pref- I much prefer just taking the reins on a hundred percent of that and just doing it at my pace whenever I feel like doing it, you know? Um, but yeah, like I said, it, it was cool working with somebody else. I, I definitely learned a lot, but Never yeah, I think again. that's my, I think it's my, <laughs> I think that's my favorite hat to wear though. You know what I mean? Out of all the things, like, I think it makes me, I think it makes me the happiest and I like really relish in that privilege. So yeah. As a perfectionist, like you just said, how do you find the resilience or the moment to know when the song's finished? I always look at say, like an artist knowing that they're painting a picture and they could carry on adding bits or taking bits away and it could never be finished. Uh, there's yeah. got to be a point, hasn't there, with every song and every album where you're able to just accept that's finished now and not wake up the next day and just add another guitar or slightly add some more reverb to the vocal or something. How do you yeah. be so kind of um, self-controlled that you can then say right i'm drawing a line there and that's it yeah dude i think that was one of the things i struggled with for the longest time and i think i'm just now starting to figure out how to how to manage that and i think (laughs) the best thing from the best thing for me has just been giving myself deadlines and like you know whether i feel like it's a hundred percent there or not like by this specific date whatever is there that's what is gonna go but I, i mean i always give myself plenty of time yeah and uh but I've also learned like sometimes I've I, I've had the tendency to like over bake things. So I've all, I've also been getting better at like taking away things that just don't need to be there because it's easy to just sit and add layer upon layer and like effect on effect, you know, to every stupid little part. But at the end of the once you like move back and try to look at the big picture and everything, it's actually it becomes kind of like a, a reverse challenge of like okay what is like the fundamental elements that this song needs to be the most impactful so it's almost like having a house with a bunch of clutter and you know once you get all that clutter out and you see the room for like the size that it is and like the beauty of the room itself you know what i mean that becomes almost like an obsession in itself just like getting rid of any fat that doesn't need to be there that's actually become like a new thing that i've enjoyed kind of enjoyed doing so yeah, it's actually it's it's been very beneficial for sure. But yeah, like I said, I just I give myself deadlines and I try to just push through and make sure I get it done. <laughs> With your uh, latest set of releases, I've seen that you've gone down the whole kind of volume one, volume two, volume three, um, mm-hmm. and I think is it as we're sitting here, volume one and volume two are out, but we're waiting on volume three. Mm -hmm. And I wondered what your kind of thought process was instead of just releasing an album. What was it that made you want to kind of break this down to three separate releases? Um, So like our last record, Swan Song. Yeah. uh, It was an album that came out like right, I think it was like towards the end of COVID. Yeah. And uh, honestly, like I felt like a good chunk of those songs just never got like to see the light of day. Like nobody... It was like people only paid attention to the singles and that like really bummed me out because some of my favorite tracks were were not singles. And uh, so I was like, I had been asking uh, the label and the band for a while if we could do like some like in between release releases. So like just an EP or like some singles and stuff. And finally, I I managed to talk them into it. And that was the first set of uh, the first EP, which was Forgotten, Left Behind, Divide yeah and those songs those songs became three of our top songs so i was like okay i i I like this way better can we just continue to do this for at least like a record's amount of time and they agreed to it so yeah i kind of it gave me the leisure to kind of just write whenever i felt like writing as opposed to like here sit down for like a month or two and write 12 songs um and somehow make them cohesive and and cool in their own you know in their own right yeah, this let me. This allowed me to kind of just like write in between tours when I felt up to it and felt inspired, and um, yeah, and it also gives each each song a time to shine. It, every song gets like you know a month or two to just live and breathe on its own with a visual, you know. So yeah, it's just kind of made every song feel more special, you know. Get its its time to shine, which you know, with any album, there's always going to be a set of songs that 
are just kind of like on the back burner. People don't you tend to skip over it, but yeah, it's been nice. Just getting to write when I feel like it has been just the biggest blessing. It's been awesome. Does it feel good as well? Because you were kind of pushing for this for so long that I think yeah. when I, I think when I looked earlier, it's something like you've generated, I think nearly 30 million streams or something between volume one and volume two. And That's awesome. I must, didn't even know that. That's cool. <laughs> it, must, it must be like a huge pat on the back and know that that was the right way to go with this kind of free song EP series. It's like, uh, imagine it had completely bombed and you'd have been like, ah, oh, like I've pushed for this for so long and yep, I yeah. was wrong. But now you can be like, see, this was right. Yeah. Oh, I made sure to put in extra effort to m- <laughs> make sure to prove myself right. Yeah. I I probably put an album's worth of time into those first three songs. Well, into all the songs, you know, and that's another thing is just like whenever you have a smaller set of songs and like pretty much unlimited time, it's like you can try so many different things. You can fail a few times before you get to like what really clicks and lands with you. Um, whereas when you're making an album, it's almost like, you don't really have that luxury of time. You know, you just kind of perfect something, even if it's not your favorite thing, you just kind of have to perfect it to a place to where you at least don't hate it. Um, (laughs) But I really, I got to, there was a lot of trial and error and I really got to just experiment and actually have fun again writing, you know, without feeling like any constraints of time or anything like that. So yeah, it was awesome. I'm really grateful to our label for allowing me to try things that way because not, not many labels would have that that level of trust you know so i've said recently actually on a few interviews uh i think the art of a really good album is fading um that's no disrespect to any band but i remember growing up buying an album on cd you'd listen to it in its entirety because it wasn't like spotify where you can have shuffle and all this and Mm -hmm. it made you really appreciate the whole concept of an album and the way that the songs are meant to flow together and Sometimes mm-hmm. they can tell a whole story and you sit and look at the lyrics and everything. And sometimes yeah. now music is so disposable. You can listen to a track and then forget about it. Cause it's just a bit of storage on your hard drive. And mm-hmm. I kind of miss the thought and the, the time spent on the journey that an album can take you on. So I can mm-hmm. see your, I can see why you went for these EPs instead, which can still tell a story when they're all put together as three separate volumes. But yeah, I, I do worry that people aren't going to be putting so much thought or effort and just try and get the singles out there at the moment to try and get those huge numbers and people's attention mm-hmm. when the album should be doing that, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's still like tons of bands that that do that very successfully it, it is a really hard thing to do though too whenever you're considering bands that tour like so yeah. much you know what i mean like to make like a, a really strong album that can take like i mean for some bands and some artists that can take like six months to a year sometimes even more in some cases you know what i mean but when your band is also your business and things like that and writing on the road usually isn't the easiest thing it, it can be really hard but i do agree i there are still albums like I really appreciate an album every now and then when it comes around. But usually those are albums that people had the time to, you know, really spend crafting that. So it, it really is hard. And it's like, I totally get what you're saying. I, I see it on both sides for sure. Um, but like for, for me personally, like um, my songs don't typically like, I'm not like big on overarching themes for like big yeah. long releases. I, I, I think doing like smaller ones for me, at least right now in my life, like currently, I think it it made more sense to try to tie like three together at a time. But what's weird is actually I'm kind of noticing like parallels between the EPs that I didn't even know subconsciously were like kind of intertwining with each other. So it's kind of happening like almost on accident or accident, you know? (laughs) Um, But yeah, I mean, it's, it's cool. Uh, yeah again i i get what you're saying yeah i i I definitely feel the same too like growing up some of my favorite albums you know like under oath and stuff like that yeah um their albums were always like that was such an experience you know like just getting to sit and listen to the whole thing front to back all together that was something very very sweet but yeah it is kind of sad like living in the tiktok age now like i don't really i mean i've talked to so many people about this like most people i talk to like don't even even if it's a band they love like it 
they'll maybe listen to the full album like one time you know what i mean but then they just go back to singles and stuff like that but i think that has a lot there's to do too with much just out like, there as well isn't there like the market's flooded everyone's in a band everyone's got a podcast so to try and win someone's dude, attention you, you, is just exactly every friday there's so so many new movies music everything you know it's just like we're being flooded with content yeah. all the time so yeah it is hard it's a rat race the new age rat race for sure and we're all part of it but um are you looking yep. forward i think as we're sitting here um it's just over a month now until you come to the uk and there's obviously london yeah. leeds nottingham manchester bristol there's loads of dates but um yeah are you really excited to get back here and play those songs to people yeah we haven't been over i think it's been since uh before covid so that'd yeah, be like, like 2017 2018 something like that so it's been a long long time so yeah no we're all very stoked it's it's been long overdue. We've been trying to come back since COVID. We just, nothing has made sense. So I'm glad we finally get to come over and headline also. It'll be nice to play a nice long set and kind of make up for lost time. So yeah, it'll it's be It's amazing sweet. as well. Like um, I was looking before today, I've, most of the tour dates are sold out. So uh, it's going to be absolutely yeah. rammed. And uh, yeah, Which is I think... crazy. I, I, I feel like Europe has been our worst market our entire career. It's like we would go over there and just kind of feel like, did, are we like known at all over here <laughs> like it was always just kind of uh pretty much a miss so this is pretty exciting to see that you know there are people that are excited to come out so yeah well, it seems like cool. the secret is leave it five or six years keep people wanting yeah. to come and then come over yeah i think yeah maybe we cracked it <laughs> that's it and with yeah. the songs when you're obviously writing them especially with the new eps do you find it challenging then to play those songs live and do them justice? Or when you're recording and producing them, do you bear in mind the fact of not doing too many overdubs or making the guitars sound too polished or having too many different takes so you can still do those songs justice when performing? Yeah, I try to be a little bit mindful of it. I've definitely like written myself into holes before where it's like, oh, actually, like how do we pull this one off? To... Yeah, yeah, exactly. We all, we've luckily we've always been able to figure it out. Um, there are like two two songs that I've still never tried to even do like as a one take. So we'll see how that works out. But I have faith. It, there there are other songs I think that I've I've managed to figure out that I think are harder. So I think we'll be all right. But yeah, it always is kind of a, a dicey situation stepping into a new song after only performing it in the studio in little sections. So uh, it's gonna be we'll exciting. figure it out. I'm confident. I think I'm going to try and come to uh, the Manchester date. So it's not too far awesome. away. So I'm, I'm really looking forward and uh, I'll make sure I come and For say sure. hello. Um, yeah, well. One thing uh, I always do on the podcast, and it's my, my last question for you today, my friend, is... Um, as we end the podcast, every guest that comes on, I've, I've kept it this way since starting the podcast, gets to choose a song that means something to you. Now, I know as a songwriter and as a fan of music for so many years, you're going to have a million songs in your head. But mm -hmm. as the interview is all edited and ready for the world to listen to, a song will play at the end, and that is chosen by you. And I wondered, I'm putting you on the spot now, it's not easy, but... Is there a song that comes to your heart and your kind of soul before any other that you'd love to be played today after we've uh, had this interview? So there was this band uh, back when I was a teenager that I found. Uh, they were called the Honorary Title. I don't know if you've heard of them before. Never. They were like this super obscure, super emo band. Um, and I recently went back and listened to them again just to see if like there was anything there. Um, <laughs> and uh, there was. This band's fucking sweet. Uh, the honorary title and then the song is uh, everything i once had it's so good it's the most emo thing you'll ever hear in your life but very very cool very emotional very raw i don't think i've heard anything like it since so yeah i've been delving back into those records what i love about this podcast sometimes is someone will bring something new like you've just done and now mm -hmm. i'm going to discover a whole new band which i've never heard before so people can pick all the big songs and tell me a nirvana yeah. song or a queen song but when someone yeah. brings something new i'll probably end up going down a rabbit hole for the next few days now and just listening to that band so i'm really excited to find something new dude there it, it's very whiny but it's it's cool there's some like really really haunting like dark uh meaningful stuff in there it's, i think you'll enjoy it <laughs> awesome man uh it's been an absolute uh pleasure having you on the podcast
Thank you, man. Appreciate you having me. So there it is. There's my interview with me and Landon. And as I said at the start of today's interview, go and give this band your time. Go and see them on their UK tour as they're playing right now. Go and download their music, stream it, do whatever you need to do. Buy a vinyl. They need your support and they're absolutely awesome. And once you do and you go and listen to the plot in you and you think, yep, Mark was right, they were fucking awesome, then please let me know on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram because I love reading people's replies and people that discover new music because of this podcast. And if you're a long-term listener, thank you so much for always coming back and supporting the podcast. If you're listening to this today and you've enjoyed the interview, please take the time to share it. I say it on each and every episode because it's crucial to the growth of Mark and me. If you're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, why not just take a second to hit that reshare button or retweet or whatever you need to do to spread the word because it really does go a long way. I also have a Patreon account. This keeps the lights going on for the Mark and Me podcast. And truly, I do need the support. On there, you can sign up for as little as literally £2 a month. And in return, I give you a welcome pack that includes stickers, a monthly newsletter, a badge, and also exclusive episodes called The Lost Tapes that are only for people that support me on Patreon. There's a link on markandme.com and I really need the support. Right, things have been absolutely hectic lately. You've seen a lot more episodes coming out and it's not going to slow down anytime soon. But just before I say goodbye, let's give a quick shout out to the sponsor of the podcast, Richer Sounds. As always, guys, if you're in the market for anything to do with audio and visual, hit up richersounds.com or visit any of their high street stores. Right, I'm going to go now and edit because I've got loads of stuff to come your way. So until I bring you a new episode, look after yourself, listen to the plot in you, Take care, and I'll speak to you all very soon. Everything I You are everything I First Avenue, we went there solely for you So you can flirt with my best friend Kiss a girl and tell me why you're laughing Well, it won't hold on No, it can't hold on to this There's a hole in the trust that we mapped out in my bed for six long months there's a hole in the trust that we mapped out in my bed for six long months six long months but it won't hold on February Valentine's Day Did my best to avoid the red cliche So you dumped me on the subway On my way to work at nine in the morning Everybody else is holding bouquets Now I'm holding my face in the basement Scratching away for any trace Of affection you will leave Falling victim to the public spray I won't hold on I can't hold on, I won't hold on to this Saw a silhouette, the perfection, the outline of my dreams The blur that made everything I had and put it all to shame I just won't hold on to this